two, you should have two different pages. One has three questions from the shorter catechism. <clears throat> the second is a timeline with a bunch of dates on it. Two handouts. up there if someone wanders in late we'll get them back to them Come on up and have a seat. There are handouts right here if you need handouts. There's two different pages y'all need to get. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Um, if you'll recall what we're doing, uh, we are <clears throat> going through this particular pamphlet, What is Biblical Church? And this class, which is the unified class for adults during the summer, is kind of a combination of a beginning class for newcomers, an introduction to what the Christian church, and in particular Covenant Presbyterian Church, believes, and also a recapping of some of the things that the leadership of this church, specifically the deacons and elders, believe so that the congregation knows the undergirding principles that the leadership holds to for better communication. Now, last week, our intrepid leader, Jerry Scott, left us off on this page. We were just introducing Jesus Christ and the Nicene Creed. However, rather than break his flow, I have been given the liberty of doing something a little bit different. So he's going to step back where he left off when he returns on that page. But <clears throat> what I'm going to do is give you an overview of Westminster standards and where they are historically. And so again, I'm talking about this and the shorter catechism, and there is a larger catechism, and the three questions before you, which is the word of your handout as opposed to the timeline, there was also a larger catechism. But we're gonna look at three questions out of the shorter catechism. This is the other document along with the larger catechism that was produced. 1643 to 1648 in London, but I'm going to try to bring out three different things. This is our worldview, by the way. Maybe you can recognize my geographic attempt on the board. So this is our worldview, okay? 
I want you to try to integrate these three aspects from what I'm going to talk about today. The Westminster Standards do not stand in isolation. They didn't appear de novo in 1643 or 48, 1643, 1648. They didn't just pop out of London out of the blue. There's a continuum that was going on. The three questions that I chose that we're going to go over first of all bring with them the idea that the Holy Spirit was and is and always will be guiding this progression of events of bringing God's word to us and because we are a reformed Christian congregation bringing it to us inerrantly, okay? So the Holy Spirit is in control, okay? Always has been, always will be, but my point today is to see that up here in London in 1643 to 48, this didn't just spring into view without some history behind it. And we're gonna look at that a little bit, but I'm, want to emphasize hey, Bert. Mm -hmm. what is the definition of reform maybe I wish I hadn't used that word <laughs> let's say the biblical church let's say Christ's church it is a word that we need to quit using it's used so much now because we talk about reform dogmatics with Herman Bavink uh, institutes of reform theology uh, so it's a word that we think denotes what occurred. And again, the starting point's a little bit fuzzy because there were some predecessors in Wycliffe and John Huss that we're gonna talk about. But we say it started in 1517, and we're gonna get to that when we go through the timeline. But we do, we do tend to use the word reformed to mean that what happened with the Roman Catholic Church had reached such a point of bankruptcy that Martin Luther reached the conclusion that it just couldn't be reformed from within. So Martin Luther made a judgment call that he, he, was, a, he was a monk within the Roman Catholic Church, right? He'd been chained, trained all his life. That's who he was. He finally reached the point where he said, I can't fight against the powers that be within the Church of Rome. There's got to be a restart. We have to reform from without. So that's the start of the Reformation. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's a little bit fuzzy because there's some other things that led up to Martin Luther's break. And the, way, the reason I say that was the point of the break, Wycliffe in England, what, 200 years earlier, 150 years earlier, had reached the same conclusions about the bankrupt policies in Rome, but he was still trying to reform from within. Now, John Huss in Prague, who was essentially a Wycliffian, he had, been, he, had, he had drunk deeply from the wells of Wycliffe and essentially rewrote what on the continent out here in Bohemia, over here in Prague, he essentially took what Wycliffe had to say and rewrote it in the Czech language of the day and he was burned at the stake for his trouble by Rome. So he was essentially the first Christian martyr of the Reformation era. So uh, for, for his efforts, uh, he was burned alive. But, but we'll talk about that for a moment, and he, he's on your timeline. But back to the thing about before we get started with this timeline, which is, I think, going to prove very interesting to you, let's go through these three questions and see how in all of this, and if we have time on the clock, I'm going to get to a point at which I'm going to uh, read through a apologia for the Catholic Church. Okay? So why would Bert do that? Because there, there, there are forefathers. All of this grew out of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is a great institution. Does it have a lot of flaws today? Yeah. Are there things that we would change about the Catholic Church today? Yeah. Are there things that we would change about our church today? Heck yeah. But I'm going to go through, if, if I have time, back to some things about the Catholic Church today that uh, 
you'll see historically there are forebears. They just are on the continent. If it hadn't been for the Catholic, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to the three questions. And um, even before we do that, one of the things that we always get back to in this thing, let's reemphasize what do we say, throw them out, y'all know them, we've gone through this, what do we say are the marks of a Christian church? Now this is a helpful thing to have in your uh, Batman utility pack on your belt because if in a transient society, if we relocate, what are the things if you had to move across the land of the heathen, live in Tuscaloosa, what would you look for as a mark of a biblical church? What should that church be doing? Throw them out. What are some things that you should be searching for? And you guys know what these Scripture. Or you can, you, right, you can start with the three. We said there's five. I really don't think there are three solas. Three solas of Martin Luther are only Scripture, faith, grace. Okay. Preaching of the gospel. And we would say when you preach from the pulpit, you should hear expounded both the New and the Old Testament because the covenantal message of God and Christ, because we just spent a whole Sunday school class about searching and finding Christ in the Old Testament, is in the Old Testament. So you don't want to see soul concentration on the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Word of God. What else? What else should be a characteristic that you see in a church, a Bible-believing church? How about proper administration of sacraments. proper administration of the sacraments? We don't handle snakes. We don't have dancing in the aisles. We, the, the regulatory principle is in place to some extent. The sacraments are properly administered. Okay. What else? Prayer. Big feature of a Bible-believing church. You should see prayer. One other thing that we don't like to talk about too much, discipline. There should be discipline, and one of the reasons that we have discipline is the church should demonstrate fellowship of the believers, and Tom did a great, Tom Brantley did a great couple teaching sessions in Sunday school a year or so ago about this concept of there are guardrails within which we operate and to have deep and abiding fellowship with each other, we need to share certain core principles outside of which, nah, that's a little bit heretical. We don't quite get over here as do some sects and say, well, maybe it's really true that maybe uh, Jesus Christ was a brother of somebody, no, no, no. So we have guardrails which in which, within which we operate that define our fellowship, which means our fellowship with each other is much deeper because we all are operating on the same core values and principles. So that's also a mark of the Bible-believing church. Okay, let's go to these three questions, kind of the shorter catechism. And <clears throat> I love this start because Starting, does everyone have the three questions? A couple interesting things as you're skipping through the shorter catechism, you will notice a couple things occur here. Let's read question 29. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? This is the first time in the Shorter Catechism that the focus has changed a wee bit. The word we, first time you'll see the pronoun we. Up until now, the Shorter Catechism, through questions 28, has been dealing with defining what we are to believe concerning God. Now it's going on to describe things that we are to believe concerning God, but this is the first time the focus is even mildly directed at us, and it uses the pronoun we.